نحمده و نسلی على رسوله الكریم اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رب شرخ لی صدری و یسر لی امری و احل العقدت من لسانی یفقه قولی و جعن لی وزیر من اخلی اللہم فکہنا فی الدین رب زدنی علما اعوذ باللہ ان اکون من الجاہلین اللہم الہمنا رشدا و عیزنا من شرور انفسنا اللہم ارین الحق حقا و رزقنا اتباعا اللہم ارین الباطل باطلا و رزقنا اجتنابا آمین سم آمین السلام علیکم و رحمت اللہ و برکاتہ سورة النساء ورس سیونٹی ایٹ اللہ سبحانہ و تعالی سیز اینما تکونو یدرککم الموت ولو قنتم فی بروج مشیدہ و ان تصبہم حسنت یقولو حازہ من عند اللہ و ان تصبہم سیئت یقولو حازہ من عندک قل قل من عند اللہ فما لہا علاء القوم لا یقادون یفقحون حدیثا Wherever you may be, death will overtake you, even if you should be within the towers of lofty construction. But if good comes to them, they say, this is from Allah. And if evil befalls them, they say, this is from you. Say, all things are from Allah. So what is the matter with those people that they can hardly understand any statement? Verse 79, what comes to you of good is from Allah, but what comes to you of evil, O man, is from yourself. And we have sent you to people as a messenger, and sufficient is Allah as a witness. Verse 80, وَمَنْ يُطِئِ الرَّسُولَ فَقَدْ أَطْوَعَ اللَّهِ وَمَنْ تَوَلَّا فَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ عَلَيْهِمْ حَفِيظًا He who obeys the messenger of Allah has obeyed Allah, but those who turn away, we have not sent you over them as a guardian. Verse 81 And they say, We pledge obedience to but when they leave you, a group of them spend the night determining to do other than what you say. But Allah records what they plan by the night. So leave them alone and do what? Tawakkal ala Allah wa kafa billahi wakila. So leave all of your enemies and those planning evil. Against you, Allah says, leave them alone and do what? Rely upon Allah. Why? Because Allah is sufficient as a disposer of all the affairs. Verse number 81. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking us all to do what? Tawakkal ala Allah. Why? Because, وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ وَكِيلًا Allah is asking us to rely or to depend on Him, to trust Allah, to have reliance in Allah. What do we mean by tawakkul or what will we mean? <coughs> what do we mean by tawakkul and what do we mean by reliance is to rely on on his help, to rely on his support, his sustenance, his protection, his provision. He who is, who is the merciful, he who is the sustainer, he who is the provider of all the provisions. Consider him as the attorney, consider or take him as the guardian. This is what reliance or tawakkul means. It is the trust or reliance in Allah when we say, as we have been taught in the verse 129 of Surah Tawbah, 
ഹസ്ബി അള്ളാ ലാ ഇലാഹ ഇല്ലാഹു അലൈഹി തവക്കൽ തുവഹുറബുൽ അർഷിൽ അസീം സഫിഷ്യൻ്റ് ഇസ് അല്ലാഹ ഫോർ മീ ദർ ഇസ് നോ ഗോഡ് ബട്ട് അല്ലാഹ് എൻ ഹിം ഐ ഹ് പ്ലേസ്ഡ് മൈ ട്രസ്റ്റ് Alayhi tawakkal to means what? In Him, in Allah have I placed my trust. He is the sustainer of the magnificent throne. Similarly, in verse 173 of Surah Al-Imran, Allah says, Hasbun Allah ni'mal mawla wa ni'mal wakeel. Allah is sufficient for us. How excellent He is as a guardian. How excellent He is. as an attorney so this is what is being ordered to all of us to have reliance and thus trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now we need to understand also that having trust in Allah how does a believer need to behave what should a believer do how what sort of manners and what sorts of behaviors and activities he is supposed to adopt once he puts his trust and faith into allah in other words what would be the implications of the trust of allah in our lives trust on allah does not by any means it does not imply that the bondsman should stop struggling or striving are working for achieving their aims their goals and targets of life or they should stop working hard for earning their livelihood just by saying that we have trust in Allah and he is the provider he is the sustainer so he will provide us and he will feed us and he will he will attend to all our requirements and necessities and then sit with hands off all the work no 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 this is not having trust actually you know what having trust in allah and having reliance in allah means that the person should work struggle endure to the utmost capacity obviously within the permissible limits of his life and then after working and struggling then after that to have trust in allah that is our struggles and our efforts and our endeavors will be fruitful only with his help his support and that after our struggles and after our efforts and after our endeavors it will be he it will be he which who will provide whatever wherever whenever whichever will be best for us this actually is what trust in allah or reliance in allah means lack of trust in allah is actually not you know what actually the lack of trust or lack of reliance in allah is actually trying to resort to the unlawful earnings a person if he tries to earn his livelihood by the forbidden by the batil or by the haram manners then he is exhibiting by his behavior by his behavior that he does not have trust in rabbul alamin in the razik the provider the razak the best and the ultimate of all the providers for his provision and sustenance he does not have trust in allah that if he just resorts to the lawful earnings and he will be provided and he will he will be able to earn by a lawful method then then this means as a lack, lack of trust in allah a person having fear of allah and a person having the trust in allah will very clearly refrain from all lawful methods the person will not resort or even think of resorting to any forbidden deed for earning for treating the sick people or for any worldly affairs will not think or would not resort to any unlawful method and this is what actually the reliance of allah means 
verse number 82 afala yatadabbaruna alquran then they then do they not reflect upon the quran if it had been from any other than allah they would have found within it much contradictions so now in this verse 82 of quran allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing us in an interrogative manner he is asking all of us afala yatadabbaruna alquran afala yatadabbaruna alquran means what tadabbur takes its root word from dal ba ra and dubr means the lowest of the hind part of the body the part the lowest part is what the hind part is what the hind is which is behind the front that it is comes after the front the lower is which comes after the upper so tadabbur means what to go after something to follow something to pursue something in fact allah is asking here that after reciting quranic verses don't they go after it don't they go don't they follow don't they pursue the meanings of the verse they've recited don't they think after reciting don't they pursue the meanings and the message of the verse they've recited don't they try to think don't they try to concentrate or ponder or to, don't they try to comprehend what they have recited in the verse of quran don't they try to understand the message of the verse the lesson of the verse or the orders the do's and the don'ts of the commandments of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which have been given in that verse and then after relating or comprehending the message or the verse or the lesson of the verse don't they relate it with their own state of affairs so you know what actually this verse implies that it is not just reciting the arabic text of the quran which has to be done the verse is actually teaching all of us that all of us who are reading and who are learning the quran we just not it's not just that we should be reciting the arabic text of quran we actually need to think to put our souls our heart our minds to ponder to concentrate trying to comprehend and try to understand the message and the lesson of the verse and then to make a personal check out or a self accountability that this is what the verse has told me this is what allah is ordering me this verse is giving me this do or this verse is giving me this don't then i would make after that a personal check out and a self accountability where am i what am i doing what am i doing where am i standing relating to the orders of allah in this verse so this is what allah is asking all of us to do when we go through the message of quran verse 83 <coughs> verse 83 allah says and when there comes to them information about public security or fear they spread it around but if they had referred it back to the messenger or to those of authority among them then the ones who draw correct conclusions from it would have known about it and if not for the favor of allah upon you and his mercy you would have followed shaitan except for a few so now in this verse allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is has condemned allah has condemned for the believers that if they happen to get or receive any piece of information or they hear a news may it be a public news or a personal information then they should not go about 
they should not go about spreading it to all those around them to spread it or to propagate it to all those around them that is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is is has condemned in the worst the spreading of any hearsay news allah has condemned any forms of rumors being spread by the believers and at the same time allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also instructed us an alternative behavior to stop doing this then do what you would relate that there are wherever allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says gives us a do they don't do this there and in the same words or in the very next words allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes up with then what to do so this is a very important thing to realize that whenever we are preaching or whenever we are teaching or whenever we are passing on the message of quran whenever we tell a don't of quran we should at the same time simultaneously also tell about what to do the do's and don'ts of quran go parallel you know why because when we tell somebody the don't and the person stops doing that devious act and that sinful act which was guided to him by the shaitan when the person stops doing hearing that these are this is the don't of allah and the person stops doing that then what happens that all the time and all the energy and maybe all the all the money which was being spent to do that activity was now will now be free will now be free the person will have time will have energy and will have money which he used to spend on doing that thing on doing that sinful activity on doing that devious activity is guided to him by shaitan so now once that that time that money that energy is free until and unless immediately a do is told suggested or instructed you know what the shaitan will do the shaitan will or might and will surely who is adubu mubin who is our open declared enemy the shaitan is definitely going to suggest another big or a major sin and the person who was doing one sin will leave that and will opt or will start another sin as suggested by shaitan so to prevent this before the shaitan suggests and before the shaitan takes the time and the money and the capabilities and potentials and whatever they are we need to suggest the do at the same time <coughs> so this is a manner which we very frequently come across in the quran and also in the hadith that allah gives a do allah says a don't and then immediately suggests the do so here allah has said a don't for spreading of the rumors and has suggested the two that is an alternative behavior what has to be done so spreading of rumors here is being condemned because you know whether they be a public news or whether it is a personal news once it is spread out as a rumor it will be much against the personal or the public interests it may when it is a public news it may it may cause unrest or spread fear and chaos and if it is a personal news it may be a source of dishonoring or defaming a person so spreading of rumors scandal mongering is a bad ethics and it is ill manners and prophet sallallahu alaihi said it is sufficient for the person to be dishonest that he believes and he spreads all the hair say that whatever he hears or to whatever piece of information or news comes to him without confirming without verifying without checking without proving just starts talking and quoting and then spreading it to the others all around him this is a form of a dishonest behavior 
Spreading rumors is generally a manner of the people who have small minds, free minds, empty minds, people who have all the time in the world. They don't have anything better to do, nothing better to do. Okay, let's just talk and spread these news. They have all the time in the world to talk about pointless things. So generally it is, you, you might be relating and you might be knowing that generally it is the youngest child of the family who is the first with the bad or the good news. Any fight, any upsetting thing, anything being broken in the house, the moment the father walks in, it is the youngest child which usually comes out with the report. So small minds, small minds would be doing all this. Allahumma la taj'alna minhum. And generally spreading and loosely talking and spreading news and spreading rumors is generally more common in women folk. As I, I read somewhere that the four means of communication are telephone, telegraph, television, and you know the fourth? Tell a woman, tell a woman. And believe you me, nowadays, tell a woman with a telephone, with a mobile, with an with a with an iPhone or with an Android in her palm top. This would no doubt be the fastest means of communication. So that is what we need to do. We need to restrict, check, control ourselves to indulge in such activities and such conversations and the spreading of rumors and scandal mongering because this has been condemned in Quran. Verse 84, فَقَاتِلْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ So fight in the cause of Allah. You are not held responsible except for yourself and encourage the believers to join you that perhaps Allah will restrain the military might of those who disbelieve. And Allah is greater in might and stronger in punishment. Verse 85 Whoever intercedes for a good cause, for a noble cause, will have a reward therefrom. And whoever intercedes, whoever intercedes for an evil cause will have a burden therefrom. And ever is Allah over all things a keeper. Now in verse 85, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the concept of worldly intercession. We've in detail talked about the intercession hereafter. But now here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning about shafa'atan, the intercession in the world. Worldly intercession can be shafa'at al-hasanatan. As Allah is mentioning here, shafa'atan hasanatan, that is the intercession for a noble for a righteous, for a good cause. And then there will be shafa'at, the sir. There will be intercession for an even, for a shafa'atan sayyi'atan. That will be the intercession for an evil, for an unjust, just, or an unfair cause. Like, to make you more clear, when a person intercedes for somebody, intercedes or pleads for any person around him, like for a job or an admission in a school, in a college, an appointment or any promotion in the job or any posting in the job, a friend intercedes for all these things, but the person for whom the intercession is being done for any of these above and the person who is being interceded for is actually not deserving. He is not capable of taking up that job or being admitted 
the person is not qualified enough and the person is not appropriate for that job for the appointment for the admission or for the promotion then this form of intercession is what it is shafa'atan sayyi'atan and this has been condemned this is forbidden because it will be clearly it will be clearly a dishonesty it will be unfair and this will not be just this will be falsehood and this would be cheating but in the contrast if the person who is interceding or pleading for a person in any of the matters for which the person is very well qualified he's capable he's deserving he's suitable then this intercession is what shafa'atan hasanatan this is the righteous this is the pious and this is the intercession for a good cause and as you must have experienced there there are many people in the society of today who are qualified who are deserving and they are deprived of their due rights just because of these unlawful intercessions of for the incapable and underqualified or the non deserving individuals this is injustice and it is merely because of this unlawful intercession by the wicked people that people who are qualified who are deserving who are capable who are suitable for the posts for the appointments for the admissions for the promotions they stay behind and this is all injustice and this is all falsehood by the wicked people and this causes frustrations this causes social unrest the people who are qualified are then frustrated and this causes them to turn into delinquents and robbers and decoits and this is creates unrest in the society and not only for all these causes there can be intercession for the monetary help or for the support of a person who is poor and needy and deserving so if a person intercedes or pleads any other person to help to support a needy and a poor person so this also will be shafa'atan hasanatan this will be a virtuous deed like you see if a person a woman comes over to me and she asks for help monetary support for like the medical treatment or the surgery of her husband and she is in a crisis but then i am in a state of affair that i can't help her out i am not monetary monetarily in a position to support her but then i think of it that i have a friend who generally spends a lot of charity so and she's affording as well so i take this woman and i take her to my friend and there i intercede i plead i try to convince my affording friend that this woman is narrating the true story and she is honest and she is actually poor and needy and she is now actually in a state of crisis the whole story is real it's no fake story she is not being dishonest she is just not trying to cheat us no and my supporting her and my backing her up and my interceding for her my pleading for her and convincing and motivating my friend to support her and she spends she gives her like um 50000 rupees now you know what my friend who is going to spend 50000 rupees in as charity in the path of allah to support that poor woman will obviously no doubt will obviously be rewarded but you know what as according to this verse of quran allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is promising us what that i who pleaded and i who interceded and convinced her to help her will also be will also be rewarded with the same reward despite the fact that i did not even spend a penny so a person who is guiding for something or who is interceding for something which is noble 
will also be rewarded by all the reward of the person who is actually been who is actually doing it practically may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand all this and may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all adopt all these mannerisms in our real practical worldly life now verse 86 وَإِذَا حُيِّتُمْ بِتَحَيَّتٍ فَحَيُّ بِأَحْسَنَ مِنْهَا أَوْ رُدُّوهَا إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَلَى قُلِّ شَيْءٍ حَسِيبًا As the translation goes here, Allah is saying, And when you are greeted with a greeting, greet in return with, a, with, with one better than it, or at least return it, in a like manner indeed allah is ever over all the things an accountant allahumma hasibna hisab yasira now here there are two meanings of this verse in this verse allah is teaching all of us some social ethics the manners for the believers to be polite to be refined individuals of the society so that the believers with their dealings and with their mannerisms they act as silent inviters toward islam and quran because it is the dealings and it is the polite manners and the refined courteous behavior of the believers which is going to be a source of silent invitation towards the teaching of islam and quran the mannerism the mannerism of the behavior of the believers is going to attract people towards quran look these are the people who hold the quran these are the people who read the quran these are the people who preach the quran and how fine and how refined and how courteous and how polite are their manners and how kind are they in their dealings this will be no doubt an invitation and attraction for the people towards quran So this is why Allah is teaching us some of the very essential social ethics. There are two meanings of this verse as explained by the scholars of Quran. The first meaning is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that addressing the believers that when you are being given a gift, a person is giving you a gift, then return a similar gift or something better than that so the first meaning according to certain scholars is teaching us the manner of giving and receiving of gifts this is what is being guided and we see that the verse of quran is teaching us the manner of giving and receiving the gifts and prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in so many translations explains and elaborates on this concept has it aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala and had the mother of believers she narrates in tirmizi that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said exchange presents exchange presents with one another presents remove ill will from the hearts the bad and the harsh feelings will be removed once we are going to exchange gifts gifts with each other hasat <coughs> abu huraira radhiyallahu ta'ala who reports in the rimzi that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said give gifts to one another because gifts remove malice from the hearts and a female neighbor should not regard the gift of a part of the trotter of a goat to another female neighbor as of no value that is the first manner of giving and taking gifts is that if anyone has given us anything as a gift then we should not look down upon it we should not consider it as something inferior or something which is unimportant and 
no and not give any importance to it that is should not look down to gift given to us however small and however little it is then hazrat aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala anha reports in bukhari that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said the the manner of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam hazrat aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala explains it the manner was that the practice of the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was that he accepted a gift and offered one himself in return of it so that is the second point number one i said we should exchange gifts give and take gifts second is that whenever we are given a present or a gift we should not consider it as inferior or we should not look down upon us and the third is that when we have been or when we are given a gift we should accept it because it is bad taste it is bad ethics refusing to accept gifts is being very arrogant it is being very pompous it is being acting very proud that i i i don't need it and i am not bothered about it and it's being very harsh for the next person the next person is going to be hurt about it so we need to accept the gift and then we need to return the gift because you know as allah says in surah rahman verse 60 hal jaza ul ihsan illa al ihsan is the recompense of goodness anything but goodness so if if any person around us has been kind to us has been caring has been loving and the person just remembered us thought about us and cared about us and all the way the person remembered and took the inconvenience of bringing us a gift and in fact might have even sacrificed some of his own or her own requirements and passed on the gift to us so we need to accept it we need to acknowledge it and then we need to return it as well and here in this verse as allah says we need to return the gift almost the same level the person gifted us or even a better than the gift we were given but again i would need to clarify that what do we mean by something being better which gift will be better does not mean that it will be better if it is more expensive it is more costly it is a better designer no but better means better as far as the intentions are concerned greater in love has more sincerity with it there is a greater sacrifice behind it so this is what makes a gift the intentions the love the sincerity the sacrifice is what makes the gift a better gift and the best gift which a believer can give his believer brother is the gift of dua the gift of a supplication and then to return it is like what has a jabir رضي الله تعالى and who reports in tirmizi and bukhari that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that if a present is made to anyone he has something to give in return he should offer it and if he has nothing to give in return you know islam is very practical and the teachings of the hadith and sunnah are also very practical they're going to be times <coughs> they're going to be times they're going to be occasions when we might not have anything to return so what should we do if he does not if he has nothing to give in return he should praise him by the way of gratitude and say good word in his behalf whoever did this did what that if the person was given a gift and he did not have anything to return but he did what he said good words and he praised him then whoever did this that he praised him and who said good words fulfilled the claim of gratitude and whoever did not concealed a favor done to him and he was guilty of ingratitude and whoever flaunts a virtue that has not been granted to him is like a man who wears a double cloak of deception allahumma la taj'alna minhum so at least if we cannot repay or return the gift then because of any economic problems or issues or any monetary tightness then at least we need to acknowledge 
We need to say words of gratitude and we need to repay in any good form of supplication or anything like that. Like saying Jazakallah, we'll be talking about this in the next tradition. Hazrat Abu Huraira reports in Tirmizi that Prophet said, whoever failed to give thanks to anyone, that is he was given a gift, he accepted it, he used it very much and then he did not have anything to return it as but didn't even say thanks he did not even by word of mouth acknowledge or said good words whoever failed to give thanks to anyone who did a favor to him failed to give thanks to allah so this is being this is being thankless and not accepting any form of gratitude and accepting and being thankful is like what Hazrat Usama bin Zaid radiallahu ta'ala and who reports in the Rimzi that Prophet guided whoever did a favor to anyone and the recited for his benefactor what Jazakallahu khaira may Allah give you a good reward he also praised him fully through it so we need to say Jazakallahu khaira that is the minimum reward or return of the gift and we're not just going to say Jazakallah. I hear of people who just say Jazakallah. And what does that mean? May Allah give you reward. What sort of a reward? No, this is incomplete. Jazakallahu khaira. May Allah give you a good reward, the better reward, the best of rewards. So this is the complete, the complete words which have been taught by the Prophet Sallallahu and when we are talking to a woman, we say Jazakillah. There is, uh, th this is how we talk to a female. And when we are talking to a male, we say Jazakallah. And we are talking to plural, to many, we say Jazakumullah. So this is the minimum how we return, need to return the gift. And then another uh, manner of the gift is Hazrat Abu Huraira and who reports in Muslim that whoever offered a sweet smelling flower should accept it, not reject it because it is very ordinary. Why? Because the fragrance is a thing of joy. So a little thing like a flower which somebody just gives, oh, gives over to us as a gift. Look, I brought this flower for you. So we should not reject it because this is the another uh, in other words prophet also said that this sweet smelling flower is a gift of paradise and has a tumor who reported in the rims that prophet said there are three things particularly should not be refused a pillow or a cushion on which we can rest and be comfortable oil which is used to apply to the skin or hair etc and milk and then uh, as far as giving gifts, another manner is it will be extremely disgraceful to claim it back. Hazrat Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Hazrat Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu both they report in Abu Dawud, Trimzi, Nisai and Ibn Majah that Prophet said, whoever claims back a gift after giving it, whoever claims back a gift after giving it is like a dog who ate something and when the stomach was filled up to capacity, he vomited it and then licked up the vomit back again. So these were the manners which had been taught to all of us by the words of the Prophet ﷺ in elaboration of this verse. The second thing which scholars say, the second manner which the scholars say have been explained here are what? That if we translate the words, it is being said that when someone says Hayyukumullah to you, Hayyukumullah means what? May you live long. Then answer in a similar or in a better form. You know what? In fact, it was a social custom of the Arabs that when they used to meet each other, they used to greet each other by saying Hayyukumullah that may you live long. And so the old uh, the order of the verse is to act in a way that when you are meeting somebody and somebody greets you, you should answer back with a similar greeting or with better words to greet in return. 
and the greeting taught to all the Muslims is Salam. This is no doubt the best and the perfect of all the greetings. And this Salam is what? It is Sha'irullah. It is a symbol of Islam. Two Muslims, in fact, two people, when they are meeting and they are saying Assalamu Alaikum, indicates what? This is a sign that these two are whom? They are Muslims and they are the followers of Prophet. So this Salam is a symbol of Islam. And remember the order to say Salam as a greeting is not just an order for the followers of Prophet ﷺ, but it was even in order for the followers of the previous Prophets. Hazrat Adam salam, when he was created, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught him the names of all the things and asked him to go towards the angels. And the first thing which Allah ordered Hazrat Adam salam, was, is hab was salim. You go and you say salam. So the history of Salam and the order of Salam starts after the creation of Hazrat Adam salam. When angels came to Hazrat Ibrahim salam in the form of humans, what did they say? They said, Salam alaikum. And Hazrat Ibrahim salam returned and answered back. So it was in the teachings of all the prophets and all the Followers of all the prophets were taught to greet each other by saying Salamun Alaikum when they met each other. And not only this, not only saying Salam is ordered in this world, but we, we go through so many verses of Quran where we learn that life hereafter, there will be Salam also. When the angel of death has the Hazrat Israel will sit at the head end of the person. He will say what? A verse of the Quran says, he will say, Salamun alaykum, utqulul jannata bima kuntum ta'amaloon. You enter the paradise because of all the deeds you used to do, all the nobles, the righteous and the pious deeds you used to do. Then at the gates of paradise, the angel will receive the people who will be entering the paradise and they will say what? Salamun alaikum toibtum. Then we learn that when the dwellers of the Jannah will enter their palaces and angels will come from all the gates and they will be greeting the dwellers of these palaces of Jannah, they will say what? Surah Rad, verse 24, they will be saying, Salamun alaykum bima sabartum fa ni'ma uqbaddar. Peace be on you. Because, because of what you've got all this, bima sabartum, because you were, you were patient. And now you have such a lovely heavenly home. And then we learn that Allah also says, that the residents and the dwellers of Jannah will also be saying salam, salam to each other. Allah says, لا يسمعون فيها الله ولا تقسيما إلا قيلا سلاما سلاما You will not be hearing any form of foul conversation or sinful, silly conversation except what will be heard salam and salama in Jannah. So this will also be at the time of death when the soul will be departing, when the person will be entering the Jannah, when the person will have moved in the palace of Jannah and when all the dwellers of Jannah will be in the gatherings, they will be greeting each other with salam and salama and then there will be a message from Allah. Salamun kaulum mir rabbir rahim. There will be message of peace be upon them for the dwellers of paradise from Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah the Mighty will be sending salam for the dwellers of Jannah. So this is this is the importance of salam. The merits and the excellence and the orders of salam in various translations 
of the Prophet ﷺ will be. Hazrat Abdullah bin Amr radiallahu ta'ala who reports in the Rimsi, the Prophet ﷺ said, O oh people, worship Allah. Worship Allah the Beneficent. Feed his bondsmen. Spread salam as much as you can. And you will reach heaven safely. Another place Prophet ﷺ was asked, Hazrat Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu ta'ala and who reports, he was asked, Tell us the deeds which will take us to Jannah. And Prophet ﷺ said, Feed the poor and the hungry. Maintain your relations of kin. Worship Allah. Make salah at night when people are sleeping. And promote and spread salam. You will enter Jannah safely. Hazrat Abdullah bin Amr radiallahu ta'ala who report, reports in Bukhari and Muslim, the Prophet sallallahu was asked, let us know what is better and more superior in Islam. Let us know of the actions which are better and superior in Islam. And Prophet sallallahu said, you feed the bondsmen of Allah. Number one, you feed the bondsmen of Allah. Two, you make salam to those you know as well as to those you do not and mark you and mind you people you know and who you know not men will be saying salam to men and women will be saying salam to women only Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala who reports in Bukhari in Muslim that Prophet Sallallahu said you will not enter paradise till you believe and you will not believe till you love each other. Let me guide you to something by doing which you will love one another. Say salam and promote salam among yourself. So the key, so the key point to enter the paradise is belief, and belief will not be completed or perfected till we do what? Till we love, till we love our Muslim brothers and sisters, and to Develop the love in our hearts for the Muslim fellow beings. We should promote salam. But it is just not salam by the tip of the tongue, by the word of the mouth. It is the spirit of Islam. The spirit of salam has to be maintained. And the spirit of Islam, as the hadith in Bukhari narrates that Prophet said, Al Muslimu man salim al Muslimuna bi lisanihi wa yadihi. A Muslim is one from whose hands and from whose tongue the Muslim brother is safe and remains protected and is not in danger of. So once we say salam, the spirit of the salam is not just by the word of mouth say may peace upon you, but actually by our, by our dealings, by our mannerism, by our conversations, we actually keep the person safe, protected from all our evil doings and from all the harm we can by our tongue or by our hands. Making, saying salam and then backbiting, saying salam and then finding fault, saying salam and then making fun of somebody, saying salam and then calling by bad names, saying salam and then slandering around the person, saying salam and then dishonoring the person, saying salam and then making evil plans of any form of hardship or any form of injustice. This is not the spirit of salam. Allah help us understand the spirit of salam and help us promote and help us, help us be regular in this greeting and returning this greeting. And how are we supposed to return and say salam Hazrat Imran bin Hussain radiallahu ta'ala who reports in Tarimzi and Abu Dawood that Prophet sallallahu was sitting in the gathering of companions and a person came and he said assalamu alaikum and Prophet sallallahu returned the greeting and he said 10 good deeds have been written in his name owing to his salam and then another person came and he said assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and Prophet sallallahu returned the greeting in the same words and he said, 
twenty good deeds have been written in his name. And then the third person came and said, "Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhi." Prophet Salaam returned his greeting in similar words, and then when he sat down, he said, "Thirty good deeds have been written in his name." So this is exactly what Quran says in Surah Al-Anam, verse one sixty one. Man jaa bil hasanati falahu ashru am saliha. Whoever does a good deed will receive a minimum of ten folds like thereof. So, if a person just says Assalamu alaikum, ten deeds. When the person says Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, twenty deeds. When a person says Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu, thirty deeds. Because third, three words, and so three multiplied by ten, thirty deeds. What? A beautiful du'a this is when we give each other this du'a at the time when we meet. This is when two people who are meeting are Muslims, and when they already know each other, then it will be they will be exchanging their sentiments of joy, of regard, of love, and of well wishing with each other. And if the two people who are meeting they are strangers. Then by saying this, they will. It will be a means of introducing each other, and a means of a declaration of trust and sincerity with each other. One saying salam to the other, and the other returning. They are both going to assure each other that they will be the well wishers, and then they will obviously develop a beautiful spiritual bond amongst themselves. So this is why. Salam has been promoted in Islam. We are asked to promote salam. Imam Malik quoted an incident from um, reported by Obay bin Kaab. Obay bin Kaab said that I used to visit Hazrat Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu taala and who very frequently. And there were many times that when I used to come, uh, Ubay bin Kaab says that many times when I used to come to Hazrat Abdullah bin Umar رضي الله تعالى عنه, he used to take me with him to the market. And I used to see that when he used to go to the market, he used to offer salam to every person he used to pass by, to a shopkeeper, to a junk dealer, to a poor person, to the rich person, to a person he knew, to the person he didn't even know. When whichever person came on his way, he met in the way. He used to keep on saying salam, and then he used to return home without buying anything. He said that Abu Bin Kaab said that one day when I went to Hazrat Abdullah bin Umar, he asked me, "Let's go to the market," and I stopped and I said, "What will you do there? You neither do you stop at any shop, nor do you buy anything, nor do you inquire about the price, nor do you sit with anyone. So, what is the big point of going to the market?" And then Hazrat Abdullah bin Umar رضي الله تعالى عنه told him the reason. I do something because it is profitable to me. I go to the market solely for the purpose of making salam to whoever I see. Hazrat. Abu Umama رضي الله تعالى عنه reports in Musnad Ahmad and Tirmizi and Abu Dawud the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said he is more deserving of the mercy of Allah among the people who is the first to offer salam. So the mercy of Allah, the barakat, the rahma of Allah will be with the person who will be the first to say salam. Allahumma jalla min hum. Hazrat Abdullah bin Masood رضي الله تعالى عنه reports that Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, "He who is the first to greet, greet with what? With salam, is free from pride. Kibr, kibr will go out of the heart. So, for our souls to get rid of arrogance and of kibr, we need to be the first to say salam." Hazrat Abu Huraira رضي الله تعالى عنه reports in Muslim that Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم has taught us that a Muslim has six rights over the other Muslims. And mind you, I want to remind you that Allah Azza wa Jal on the day of resurrection might forgive his own rights, but he will not forgive the rights of the fellow beings. Until and unless the person whose right was not duly paid or attended to forgives the person who did so, 
So a Muslim has six rights over the other Muslim. These are number one, when they meet, they should greet with salam. So this is the first right we need to be sensitive about. When they meet, they should greet each other with a salam. When he invites you, he should accept the invitation. When he seeks guidance or advice, he must advise him. And when he sneezes, he should say, Alhamdulillah. And the person should say what? Yarhamukullah. And when he is ill, he must visit him. And when he dies, he must go with the funeral. So these are the rights. And the first right mentioned here is to say salam to each other as a greeting when we meet each other. Another hadith reported says that Prophet said that angels also get upset when two Muslims meet and they don't greet each other with salam. Hasad Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala and who reports in Abu Dawood that Prophet said that when any one of you meets a Muslim brother, he should offer salam. And if after it a tree, a wall or a rock comes between them, that is they were walking together and then something comes in between them and then they come to face to face again, he should offer him salam again. So you see how frequently, how frequently we have to keep on saying this. <coughs> And then a few rules and regulations about or manners about saying salam that on entering our house or going out of our house, we need to say salam. Hazrat Anas who reports in terms that Prophet very lovingly talked to me and said, Oh son, make salam when you go to your family. It will be a source of blessing to you as well as to the members of your family. So when we enter even our own house, we have to say loud, Assalamu Alaikum. And in fact, it would be much better if we say all the three words. Entering even in our own house, this will be a source of blessing and bounties of Allah for us as well as for our, for our family members. Hazrat Qatada radiallahu ta'ala who reports that Prophet sallallahu said, when you go to anyone else's house, make salam to the inmates. And when you leave, leave by making salam of farewell. So when we enter, when we leave anybody else's house, I shall be talking about this next after the concept of salam. Hazrat Abu Huraira, radiallahu ta'ala, who reports in Taramzi, the Prophet sallallahu has guided another way. Whenever, whenever any one of you arrives in a gathering or an assembly, he should first of all greet those who were present there. And then sit down if he wants. So the person who's coming from outside should greet and should be the first one to greet the people who've been gathered there before. Afterwards, he should afterwards he should say salam again on leaving. And the first salam is not superior to the second. So that is the salam when we enter is not superior to the salam which when we leave. So in both the times we're going to say salam. Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, there are other rules and regulations for salam. Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu reports in Bukhari that Prophet Sallallahu said, the younger person should say salam to the elder and he who is passing on the road, that is the person who is walking, should say salam to those who are sitting and a smaller group should say salam to the larger group. So you see, finest of details have been guided. Then Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala who reports that Prophet said that if anyone belonging to a group that is passing say salam, it will be sufficient for the whole group. And if anyone belonging to the group that is sitting acknowledges and answers, it will be sufficient for the whole group. And then we know that if uh, we can, the salam can also be passed on. We meet a person and we ask them or her to give salam to her mother or to her sister or to her friend when she meets or when she goes home. So this can also be done and this is precedented. And when we pass on salam, this salam is a trust with the person to whom it has been passed on. And when this person passes on the salam to the person for whom it was intended, then this person needs to answer back in the similar manner as if he was actually being greeted by a live meeting. 
and uh, similarly uh, by uh, making a um, sign of the hand can also be answered prophet sallallahu when he used to be far off he used to nod his head also to make a symbol that he was saying salam and um, saying salam would be the next thing after this at meeting would be shaking hands to um, meet by shaking hands as ibn masud radiyallahu ta'ala who reports in tirmizi and abu daud the prophet sallallahu said shaking hand denotes the completion of salam so to complete our meeting first say salam and then to shake hands this was the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and what is the reward of shaking hands between the two uh, muslim uh, fellow beings is has a bira bin azib radiyallahu ta'ala and who reports in abu daud the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said when two muslims meet and they shake hands with each other Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive their sins. I repeat again, when two Muslims meet and they shake hands with each other and along with it they glorify Allah and beg forgiveness for themselves, then they will be forgiven. So this is the merit and excellence of shaking hands between the Muslims and the believers. and then hazrat ata khorsani radiyallahu ta'ala anhu reports in mota that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said shake hands with one another it removes the ill will and give presence to one another it will promote love and affection among you and enmity will disappear from the hearts so making uh, with shaking hands has been advised by prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and hazrat abu zar ghafari radiyallahu ta'ala who reports in abu daud that whenever i went to see prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he used to shake hands with me and after shaking hands the next step would be to embrace to stand up or to kiss anybody This has been reported by Hazrat Ayyub bin Bashir radiyallahu ta'ala anhu in Abu Daud that uh, Hazrat Abu Zar Ghafari radiyallahu ta'ala anhu reports that whenever I used to meet I whenever I went to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to meet him he used to shake hands with me and uh, then he narrates an occasion that once he had uh, Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had sent Uh, me for um, uh, for any expedition and i came back after a long time and then when i returned i was told that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam wanted to see me and i went up to him after a long time when i was meeting prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was sitting he got up he embraced me he threw his arms around my neck and he was embracing me and then he was kissing me also and this was the greatest blessing and this was the greatest pleasure has at abu zar ghafari radiyallahu ta'ala who said that i got in my life and then prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that when you love someone tell him that you love him so hugging or embracing and kissing is a way or a manner of letting the next person know that we love him exhibition and demonstration of love similarly has at the uh, imam shahbi radiyallahu ta'ala who reports from uh, the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he received has a jafar bin abu talib he had uh, he was returning from abyssinia and has a jafar radiyallahu ta'ala when uh, when he came back prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam embraced him and he kissed him between his eyes on the forehead so this was a very frequent manner of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and similarly has at aisha radiyallahu ta'ala and her she reports in uh, abu daud that uh, whenever hazrat fatima radiyallahu ta'ala anha used to come as daisha says that i have not seen anyone more similar to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in shape and in appearance of face and his habits of disposition and manners of walking than his daughter fatima to zuhra radiyallahu ta'ala anha and uh, hazrat aisha said that she resembled him most in all these things and when she came the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to get up out of love out of joy and he used to advance towards his daughter and take her hand in his hand he used to take her hand in his hand and he used to make her sit at his own place and there were many times when he used to kiss her hand also so this was the manner of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam with his daughter and now the manners for of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam regarding his 
kissing and embracing was that whenever he used to meet any believer he used to say salam and then he used to shake hands but then when a person used to come after a long time he used to meet any companion after a very long time then he used to get up and embrace and hug and kiss him so this was the manner in routine every person which he was meeting every day day to day life in a routine there was no hugging and kissing but when he used to meet after a long time then he used to hug and embrace and kiss and this seems very rational as well you know and then saying salam to take permission before entering the house this is also an ethic which has been very clearly talked about in quran and inshallah when we will be reading surah nur i will be talking about in in a greater detail that before taking permission before entering anybody else's house we need to take permission and the mannerism of permission is by saying salam as a, a companion hazrat qalda bin hambul radhiyallahu ta'ala who reports in tirmizi and abu daud that he had a few things and some articles which he was going to take to the house of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he took these articles he entered without making salam and without taking permission so without taking uh, any permission and without taking salam uh, saying salam he entered the house of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and what did prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam say he said that he told me to go back ask for permission by saying salam and say that may i come in because you know it was the norm it was a routine in the culture of people of arabs that they never said salam and they never took permission and they used to just barge in and walk into the houses and they not just used to come because there were no doors there were no no curtains and they just used to walk into the houses not even till the courtyards but they used to come even till the inner portions of the house without asking for any permission so islam taught them all these mannerisms as a jabir was yallahu ta'ala who reports that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said do not give permission to the one who does not convey salam before asking permission so permission has to be seeked also and permission we will seek by saying salam Hazrat Rabia bin Harash radiyallahu ta'ala and who reports that uh, once a person asked the permission to come in and he just said may i just get in it was like a very crude manner the way he talked and it was not refined and moreover he not just said salam also prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam asked the companions to go and tell him the correct way and the the polite way to take permission is to say what assalamu alaikum may i come in so this is the most refined and the polite and the most courteous way of asking permission to get in somebody's house and then uh, has a umar radhiyallahu ta'ala and who he used to seek permission when he used to say he used to say assalamu alayka ya rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam may umar come in so he used to um, tell his name he used to ask permission and he used to say salam as well so uh, this is exactly the correct way of asking permission similarly um you see um, then there was another companion who asked the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam about seeking permission from his mother hazrat itab bin yasar radhiyallahu ta'ala who reports in mota that um, he asked i asked prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam should i first take permission even when i go to my mother prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said yes then he explained the state of affairs he said that i live in the same house with my mother is it necessary for me even then to take permission before entering prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said yes first take permission then he again said i am her sole attendant that is i do all the things for her i have therefore to go to her very frequently prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said in any case go in only after taking permission would you like to say her naked he said no then go in after taking permission so this is a very fine information and instructions these are the instructions from the quran and hadith which we have been to the minutest of details guided and instructed the way we have to behave in our social dealings allah subhanahu wa taala help us remember all these things 
help us comprehend believe understand all these things and may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us act upon all these ethical manners in our social life and our dealings and may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us be all refined and polite and kind and courteous in our manners with all our fellow beings ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد اذ خديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمه انك انت الوهاب سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد ان لا اله الا انت نستغفرك ونتوب اليك سبحان ربك رب العزه عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين امين ثم امين